Welcome to another life-impacting message from City Light Church. You can find more great content like this online at citylight.church. Alrighty, we are in Romans 8, 18 to 23. We are right in the middle. So this is the middle passage of Romans 8. Um, not by show of hands, but just by like blinking wildly. How are you doing in enthusiasm towards memorizing Romans 8? Okay. That's all right. Only I can see. Nobody else can see. Some people are just staring like this, and I'm not sure if it's at the question or if it's answering the question. Um, nevertheless, uh, I know for, for a bunch of people who have been memorizing it has been already really helpful. And so we're only halfway now. So there's still plenty of time, even if you haven't memorized, even beyond the therefore in verse 1. I know you've all got that one down, which is awesome. Um, I mean, if my five-year-old has that one down, but that's okay. That's no reflection on you. <clears throat> um, there's still time. And in fact, even if we get to the end of the series and only then you go, okay, you know what? I'm going to do the work of memorizing this chapter. You will benefit from its memorization for the rest of your life. So let's do the work now. I'm um, just trying to encourage you to do this work now. Anyway, let's, let's go. We're in Romans 8:18. This is what it says. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So we're in the middle of Romans 8. As we've said every week, it's, it is Paul who wrote this letter from Corinth, the region of Corinth, to the church, the Christians in the city of Rome. And he is right, he's building this logical progression of an argument to help them understand what it means for them to live in the freedom that's been found in Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. So freedom in Christ, power of the Holy Spirit. And so this is why it seems that every paragraph starts with a because or a therefore or a for. And so here we've had a couple of fours. And right, right at the beginning, he starts for, I consider that the sufferings of this present time you hear last week, you'll know we finished with suffering. He said, you will share in the inheritance of Christ in his glory if you share in his suffering. So you, if this, then that. If suffering, then glory. And so he begins this next section, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time it's going, you know, we have, but we have, we have sufferings. We have suffering. For most people, most people in this room, and if not you, someone that you know is either entering into right now, currently in, or has just come through a time of suffering. Maybe small suffering, easily manageable. Maybe very difficult suffering you're just entering into, just got the news. Something just happened or you're in it right now or you're just coming out of it. Everybody here, or at least somebody that you know is currently going through a time of suffering. When Paul says the sufferings of this present time, what is he talking about? Uh, I want to take you, bless you, hashtag corona. No, I'm joking. Um, <clears throat> I want to take you to a place where Paul's talking about his own sufferings. This is what he's talking about. So when he's saying suffering, what's he talking about? This is what he says. In whatever anyone dares to boast, because I'm talking foolishly, I also dare. He's saying, man, we shouldn't boast, obviously. But if anyone's going to boast, this is how I'm going to boast. This is what he says. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. He's saying, I have reason to boast because of my pedigree. Are they servants of Christ? He goes, I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one. He says, are they Christians? It's, it's stupid to talk like this, but I'm a better Christian, is what he says. How does he qualify being a better follower? This is what he says. I have far more labors, far more labors, 
many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, many times near death. How is he qualifying being a better Christian? By boasting or highlighting his suffering, not his pedigree. And then he goes on. He says, I know it's crazy to boast about anything. He's just using these this kind of boasting in his weakness, in his suffering, as a kind of rhetorical device to make a point, not trying to make himself look good. He's trying to highlight what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. It says verse 24, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time I received a stoning. It said, in my body I have been beaten almost to death multiple times. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. This is how I was saying, how am I a better Christian? How am I a better follower? What does it mean to belong to Jesus? He says, not to mention other things. And then he goes on to mention other things. There's a daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I, am I not weak? Who is made to stumble and, do I not, and I do not burn with indignation? If boasting is necessary, I'll boast in my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows I'm not lying. In Damascus, a ruler under King, uh, King Ar- Aretas guarded the city of Damascus in order to arrest me so I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Paul is saying, I am not a stranger to suffering. He's saying, man, I have suffered and continue to suffer and I'll suffer again. And what kinds of sufferings? Am I just inconvenienced in my Christian walk? He's saying, no, I've been, for the sake of Jesus, I've been shipwrecked out in the open sea a day and a night thinking I was going to die. I have had people gather around me with rocks and thrown them at me until they thought I was dead. I've been whipped five times, beaten with rods three times. So I've faced dangers from everybody, even my traveling companions. I've faced dangers in the city. I've faced, faced dangers in the wilderness. I say, man, I, I know what it is to suffer. And he's boasting in his suffering, knowing that when he is weak, he is strong. What about for you? What does your suffering look like? Now, we would not be so foolish as to compare our suffering with Paul's. But man, that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. The suffering might be like he had, uh, a a physical suffering. Uh, Maybe your body's just letting you down. Maybe you're suffering from uh, just the effects of getting older. I've spoken about this even for myself. Um, Injury or sickness. I've shared before about a mate of mine. Uh, not much older than me. He's got a daughter who has terminal cancer. They have stopped treating her. Nothing left they can do but to see her just degenerate day by day until one day death will, death will come. Maybe your body just doesn't work properly. Maybe you have chronic pain or uh, infertility, some sort of degenerative issues, ADHD, anxiety, something is not working right. Maybe that's your suffering in your body. Maybe your suffering is more relational. No matter what you do, the the people who matter to you just don't seem, you don't seem to matter to them. Maybe no matter how much you try, you just can't seem to get through to people or they won't treat you right. Maybe you don't have the relationship you do want or you do have a relationship you don't want or isn't helpful for you. Tension due to your sin, tension due to their sin, tension due to no sin, just bad circumstance, bad fortune perhaps, circumstance or a different way of viewing the world. Maybe people look down on you because of your love for Jesus. Maybe you have a relational suffering. Maybe, maybe your suffering is more vocational. Maybe you just cannot seem to find work. Or you can't do the thing you do want to do. Or you're stuck doing something that you just don't enjoy doing or tolerate at best. Maybe your boss doesn't like you. Maybe you can't get ahead. Maybe your work is too difficult. Maybe you don't see any escape. Maybe your suffering <clears throat> is more to do just with the state of the world. The world is sick. Maybe you're worried about a global pandemic. Maybe you're worried about global warming. Maybe you're worried about global political unrest. Again, you don't have to put it in your hand. Who went and bought toilet paper this week when they didn't need to? I said you don't have to put it in your hand. 
but I see the hand. <laughs> like crazy, crazy scenes. Maybe you're looking at it going, I just, I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. Maybe you're tired of seeing evil always seem to triumph. Sick of hearing in the news about another woman who has died at the hands of a partner or ex-partner. Uh, powerful people taking advantage of weak people. Kids being sold into slavery for sex and other nefarious things. Maybe you're just sick of the world as it is. You don't see an end to these things. Do you ever get overwhelmed by it and just go, what the heck is going on? There are many different kinds of suffering. Um, and again, I put it to you, you have, because of the sick state of the world, and I don't mean that as in like the world is only bad all the time, um, but like we're going to look at today, the world is not as it should be. There is, you may have seasons without suffering, um, but it's likely that even in seasons where you're not suffering, you know people who are. Or you're on your way in, you're currently in, or you've just come out of some suffering. How does our faith help us in these things? What does the Bible actually say to this? Because I'll tell you what, I, I hear conflicting, confusing mes messages from people who claim to be Christians. This is what last week finished on. This is, here's a promise from verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And that's when he goes on to say, then, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Because I, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Now, what he's not doing here is trying to minimize your pain. What he's not trying to do here is saying, well, don't worry about it. Just like pick yourselves up and plow through because it, it's not really that painful anyway. He's not trying to minimize the pain. He's not trying to minimize the suffering. It hurts to be in pain. It's tough to be in relational distress. It sucks when you don't know how you're going to make it through the week. It sucks when you don't see any future for you or future in your workplace or future in your relationship or relationships. You don't know how you're going to handle the next encounter with that person don't know how, where your next meal is going to come from. Um, he's not trying to say these things don't matter. He's not trying to say these things don't hurt. There are many people in this community that know what some or all of these things feel like. Better than this, Jesus himself identifies with his suffering. Jesus himself knows what you're going through. And he knows the temptations that you face as well. In your sufferings, man, don't we suffer? Don't we? I mean, there's a suffering of whatever it is that's going on, like in your body, uh, illness or injury or anxiety or an external thing, um, relational stress, vocational stress, or just the sin in the world. There's, there's the, the pain and the weight of that. But then there's in our suffering also the weight of our temptation to run to a comfort other than the Holy Spirit, to run to or to want to take justice into your own hands. So let's say, I'm suffering. This isn't right. I am going to go and make this right. Or to think, well, seems like you just can't get ahead unless you cheat, so if you can't beat them, then join them. And just to go, well, I'm sick of trying to do things the right way. I'm just going to go and do what everyone else is doing. That will end my suffering. What Paul is not saying here is that life is awesome, so just get over yourself. He's saying, man, it sucks to be in pain. It hurts to go through suffering. But we need to go through suffering, is what he's saying. Suffering is there for our good. He's not saying, certainly not saying, if you just had more faith, your life would be awesome. I've heard people say this. I've heard people like counsel people going through grief. Like even one, one thing comes to mind where um, someone's wife had just died and someone came to him and said, man, can you just, I'm paraphrasing, can you just imagine if you had more faith, you, you could have done something here. Or another time, uh, some, someone close to me lost a child at birth and a well-meaning relative came and said, can you imagine if you just had more faith? You could even just raise this kid now. 
and these kinds of things. And that is not what Paul's saying. He's not saying your life would just be awesome if you had more faith. He's not saying come to know Jesus and then all your problems will disappear and you won't suffer anymore because God only wants you to be wealthy and healthy and successful and to escape every kind of sickness and suffering when both Jesus and his followers promise us suffering and even say that the future glory comes through and in our suffering. He's not trying to minimize his suffering when he says that it's nothing compared to the glory that's coming. What he's trying to say is, weigh up your suffering, how difficult it is, how all-encompassing it is, how much it hurts, how much it sucks, and then imagine a glory to come. How significant and magnificent and how glorious that glory is to make the weight of your suffering seem like nothing. That's what he's saying. He's not saying your suffering is nothing. He's not saying get over it. He's not saying just sweep it under a rug or, or ignore it and, and forget about it. He's saying what is to come, the glory to come, will make this look like nothing. Not because of how nothing your suffering is, but because of how glorious the glory to come is. Is making sense? It's a comparison. He's not minimizing your suffering. He is, by comparison, showing how great. Imagine, consider his own suffering. Consider Paul, the writer, the author, the one who's sharing this. He's saying, man, they tried to beat me to death. They tried to throw rocks at me until I died. They beat me with rods. Uh, the, the king of the area tried to come. I had to be, lit, like, winched down in a basket to escape death again. Uh, how many times have we been clo- without clothes or out in the cold or at risk of danger from every direction? And he said, all of this incomparable to the glory to come. It's as, it's as if this suffering is nothing. Again, not to minimize the suffering, to help you realize how great the glory is to come. This is what Oswald Chambers said about the suffering. He said, Jesus suffered according to, according to the will of God. See this in 1 Peter 4. Having a different point of view of suffering from ours, it's only through our relationship with Jesus Christ that we can understand what God is after in his dealings with us. When it comes to suffering, it's part of our Christian culture to want to know God's purpose beforehand. Certainly, we want to know, what are you trying to do here, God? He says, in the history of the Christian church, the tendency has been to avoid being identified with the sufferings of Jesus Christ. People have sought to carry out God's orders through a shortcut of their own. God's way is always the way of suffering, the way of the long road home. He says, man, as Christians, we have bought into the world's way of thinking about suffering, where our goal is not holiness and God's will for our lives. Our goal is comfort and to escape whatever suffering might bring for us. And so we try to avoid suffering every way we can, mitigate it when we go through it, even deny it or try to get out of it as quickly as possible. What Oswald Chambers is trying to say here is, that's not the way actually of Jesus. The way is actually the, the long road home. The way is through suffering. And in fact, like Paul promises us, uh, the glory comes through our identifying with Jesus in the suffering. Oswald Chambers again says, Are we partakers of Christ's sufferings? Are we prepared for God to stamp out our personal ambitions? Are we prepared for God to destroy our individual decisions by supernaturally transforming them? It will mean not knowing why God is taking us that way because knowing would make us spiritually proud. We never realize at the time what God is putting us through. We go through it more or less without understanding. Then suddenly we come to a place of enlightenment and realize God has strengthened me and I didn't even know it. So some of our suffering comes as a consequence of our own sin. We, we make sinful choices and then we suffer. Some of our suffering is us clinging to our way. We want to do things our own way and escape suffering or pursue comfort and God actually has a much better way and in the kind of like wrenching us away from our way and bringing us to the better way, we feel that pain is suffering. Whereas eventually, this is basically saying what Oswald Chambers is saying, when we actually are then on that path in that way, then we realize, oh, actually this has been for my good. That suffering was for my good. Some of our suffering is a consequence of somebody else's sin. I'm doing everything like materially right And yet somebody else drink drives. Somebody else decides to be selfish in a way that impacts me. Somebody else does something. 
and my suffering comes at a, as a consequence of their sin. Some of our suffering comes seemingly for no reason at all, just bad luck. Wrong place at the wrong time. But we know that all of our suffering is because creation has been subjected to futility. All of our suffering ultimately is as a result of sin. How do we know this? Because our scripture today tells us. Uh, old mate, John Piper, he says, there are at least these ways that God uses human suffering for our good. Five ways. He says, suffering leads to repentance. See that in Luke 13. Suffering leads to reliance on God, 2 Corinthians 8. Suffering leads to righteousness, Hebrews 12. Suffering leads to reward, 2 Corinthians 4. Suffering leads to revelation, like God revealing something to us. That's what we see in our passage here. I think there's a sixth R, which is suffering leads to resilience or steadfastness. You see that in James 1 as well. But in this passage, we see suffering is to reveal something to us. Suffering does a work in us. Again, repentance, reliance, righteousness, reward, resilience, and here, revelation. What does it reveal to us? Suffering reveals this sin-stained world, this sin-stained world's incomparability with the glory which is coming. Because of us being united with Jesus, because we share in his inheritance, because we share in his glory, what this passage shows in us, the suffering reveals in us is that this world is not our home. That this world is not all that there is. That we don't put our hope in this world, but our hope comes from somewhere else. It reveals, it reveals the grotesqueness of sin, the destructiveness of sin, and not just at sin abstract of us, but even our own sin. This is what this passage in Romans helps us understand that suffering does for us. Verse 20 says, For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. All the creation is like on the edge of its seat, waiting for you to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. So again, it's not just Christians that are, that are wanting to proclaim the message of the gospel of grace, the love of Jesus, the salvation from sin, that, that death doesn't have a claim on us anymore because of what Christ has done for us. But even all of creation eagerly awaits to see those whom God has chosen come into relationship with Him, step into this new creation. Because creation itself was subjected to futility, but in hope. So God subjected creation in His providence, in His perfection, in His own power, a part of his plan and in his love and his mercy so that creation itself would long and eagerly await the future hope, the glory to come. Likewise, oh sorry, in the hope that creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay. So that means both that creation is subjected to futility in bondage to decay. That's why when you look around at the world and you go, oh my goodness, why do evil people seem to do so well so often? Why can't we get a break? One thing finishes, the next thing begins. What is going on? We understand why. Because it's subjected to futility, in bondage to decay, but also in hope of participating in the same freedom that the sons and daughters of glory will one day walk in. So saying that the creation was subject to decay and we likewise were subjected to decay, in bondage to decay until the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit makes us a new creation the moment you first believe. What well, Paul's writing is even creation is awaiting the same kind of renewal when Jesus, our King Jesus returns to make all things new. He's purchased this newness in his death. Like his victory over death is an all-encompassing victory. It's wonderful news. The same freedom you have that you are looking forward to, this future glory, the creation, the whole creation is looking forward to this redemption as well.
It's a great promise. It's a wonderful promise. Verse 22, for, so again, it's just building. He's, 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 he's building this house. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So creation is groaning. And I mean, we, we, can, we can see that groan. And he's saying that we groan likewise. That one of my, I'm finding at least, one of my, the prayers I keep coming back to is, uh, God, how long are you going to leave the world like this? Like, please, Jesus, return quickly. Because sin and the destructiveness, like the consequence of sin, not just in my own life, but across the world is, uh, is painful. And it sucks. And it, and it's, it continues. And so I have this groaning, and I'm sure you likewise have this groaning. Like, please, Lord, bring this thing to fruition soon. End the reign of sin and death. The world's not as it's supposed to be. As it's supposed to be. We're groaning because our pain is real. We groan because it sucks to go through suffering, even though we know it's for our good. It's still difficult in the time. But we also don't have to despair anymore. We don't have to lose hope anymore because our hope is no longer anchored in the world. We can both groan because the world's not as it should be, but also have great hope because our hope is not in the world being not as it should be. It means we know that God is at work in our suffering. So, uh, if we go over to 2 Corinthians, this is what Paul has to say about what suffering is accomplishing in him and in us. He says, then we have this treasure in clay jars. He says, we're, we're fragile. We're going to suffer. But we have, tr- we have treasure in these clay jars. So this extraordinary power may be from God and not from us. So saying we are both fragile and we're powerful. So we don't get any glory, but God is working gloriously through us and in us. That we are afflicted in every way but not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. We're persecuted but we're not abandoned. We're struck down but not destroyed. Say, so, man, we are suffering, but we have this great hope in Jesus, in the power of the Spirit. Verse 10, we always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. So then death is at work in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith in keeping with what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. For we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you. Say, man, we are all going to benefit from what Jesus has done. We will all be resurrected together. We'll all as co-heirs, share in His glory. Indeed, everything is for your benefit so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. Therefore, we don't give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So He... Here, Paul, again, consider the list of his suffering and continual suffering. And we know, because he didn't know this at this time, but we know he will die for his proclamation of Jesus. He won't die an old man. He'll be killed in his suffering. And he says, our momentary and light affliction. He's a man with an eternal perspective. He's a man who understands the the gargantuan weight of glory makes his ridiculous suffering. Like we would look at him and go, oh my goodness, I, I will never feel bad about anything I go through for the rest of my life in comparison to him. He's saying, no, 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 my, you stack up all of my suffering. It is light and momentary and I'm living in light of the glory that's to come. Absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. He, he finishes, so we don't focus on what is seen, but what is unseen for what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Again, he's not saying your suffering is nothing. 
you suffer, it still hurts. And it will, and you will have, we're guaranteed suffering, basically until we die. You will suffer. But we don't live in light of our suffering because we know that this world is not all there is. We don't anchor our hope in what we can see or in this world. Our hope comes from Jesus. Our hope comes from somewhere else. Our hope is greater. And our suffering, great though it may be, is not small, but compared to the glory that's to come. It's incomparable. It's foolishness to try to even make that comparison is what he's saying. We can't, we can't do that. And so he says, we don't live in light of what we see, although it's, it's still painful. Please don't hear me trying to minimize your suffering. Saying the, the glory that's to come is so much greater. It means we eagerly await the redemption of our bodies, the day when we get to stop groaning. What a glorious day that's going to be. It actually helps us to go through our suffering, to know that one day there is an end to all suffering. It helps us to be able to groan, I mean, authentically groan in the face of a sin-stained world, to know that one day the groaning will cease. The day when we get to live fully in the new creation, not just the promise of the new creation. I know sometimes it sounds crazy to talk about a new creation. It seems crazy even in the midst of our suffering to think about, man, one day the suffering will end. Even the, pre- like the penalty of sin has been dealt with. The presence of sin is still here. The power of sin has been dealt with. and One day the presence of sin will be dealt with as well. It's amazing. It's a wonderful, glorious thing to know. But because we're surrounded by the effects of evil, because we're still in this world and even in our suffering, sometimes that future glory seems like so hard to grasp, so hard to consider, so hard to live in light of. And so this is why we have places like Romans 8, to to remind us of the glory that's to come, to remind us, yes, your suffering is and may be great, Maybe you're not going through suffering at all. You're like, yeah, that seems very reasonable that my suffering is incomparable because my life's pretty awesome. Uh, Still incomparable to us to come. Still incomparable to us to come. The more you know Jesus, the more you trust Jesus, the more you experience the realities of his excellencies, of his majesty, the more you see him in his perfection, the wonder, the glory of what's to come seems much more real. The more we get to know Jesus, the more... We're living in step with the Spirit, the more we understand the glory that's to come. This is why, like we saw last week, we can cry, Abba, Father. We actually go to God as our dad. We are God's kids, his sons and his daughters. He's gifted us with his Spirit. Yes, the power to believe. Yes, the power to live a life worthy of the calling, but also as a guarantee and a deposit that we belong to him. So we go to him and in our distress, in our suffering, we go to him and we cry, Dad, I need your help. And he's pleased to help us. The Spirit is known as the comforter, our strength. And so we, we get comfort from the Spirit and the Spirit is already in us and with us. It means we don't despair, even when we acknowledge the evil in our own hearts. But this is what suffering reveals in us. Uh, acknowledge, we, we acknowledge um, our desperate need for a saviour. We acknowledge, uh, even as we acknowledge the evil in our own hearts, um, it awakens repentance, awakens resilience, reliance, righteousness, and like we see today, the reward that's to come. So if you're in your suffering, can I encourage you, uh, go to Jesus I mean, he, he is here for you in your suffering. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus. I want to say, man, that, uh, this is not a come to know Jesus and he will end your suffering. Uh, he actually promises you suffering and even maybe more suffering if you come to know him. Like if you, if you step under his lordship, if you repent of your old ways and come under his lordship and kingship, uh, it's not an end to your suffering, although we know there will be an end to your suffering. Uh, but he promises us suffering, but he also promises that the Spirit is there with you. God himself is with you in and through your suffering. And in your suffering, he is doing a work in you to conform you to the very likeness of Jesus. 
Let's pray together and then we'll come around the table. Father God, I want to thank you that uh, you're using our suffering for our good, for your glory. That you didn't leave us unaware of what our suffering is doing in us, even though we're not necessarily aware of what our suffering will be. We know we can trust you. You have proven yourself trustworthy over and over again. And so help us to trust you. Help us to put our faith in you, anchor our hope in you. For those who are going through a difficult time now, Lord, my request is that the suffering would be short, but more so that your will will be done in the suffering. Help us not to just try to end our suffering uh, as, as quickly as possible and jump to comfort as our saviour and safety from suffering. But Lord, um, by the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to make suffering our own servant so that um, while we suffer, you, by the power of your Spirit, can do your full work in us. It's our desire. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to know more of your excellencies, your beauty, your holiness, your majesty, more of the glories that are to come, even for us, not, nothing that we have deserved or earned, but and that we have because we are co-heirs, because of what Jesus has done. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, your comforter, our helper, our power, our strength. Help us to always live in light of your spirit and in the power of your spirit. We want to try to do things in our own strength as if we ever could. And uh, Father, help us to live in light of those incomparable glories to come. And help us to offer this hope we have to others as well. So that even when we go through suffering, uh, we can extend this hope to others who also suffer. When we aren't presently going through suffering, help us to be there bearing one another's burdens. And in every sense, in every way, Lord, help us to bring you glory. In Jesus' holy name, amen. For more great content, more information about City Light Church, or to donate to the work of City Light Church, visit us online at www.citylightchurch.com.